what is going on uh, with the Hagar? What I think mean, Paul calls it an allegory, right? Paul calls it an allegory. What what's going on with the Hagar allegory? Um, what do you all think? Do you have any have, have any of you ever studied this before? Do you have any opinions about what Paul is doing here? Any opinions about what Paul's doing with the Hagar allegory? Or is it just nothing but confusion? Right? Um, here's what I think would be illegitimate to say. I think, I think it would be illegitimate to say that Paul has a method of interpretation that was, it was kind of like good for him because he's an apostle, uh, but we really can't do that. Okay? I think it'd be illegitimate for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, Apostles aren't inspired. Texts are inspired. Right? The authors are not inspired. The texts are inspired. What, what that means is God doesn't give the idea of the Hagar allegory to Paul. That would be, I think, a faulty view of inspiration. Rather, Paul is employing a hermeneutical method uh, in the text. Right? And what he writes is breathed out by God. Right, so that's the first. No, number two is um, it's a bit it's a bit arbitrary, I think, to say you know this is a legitimate interpretation method for Paul, but not for us. And it feels a bit like not relative truth, <laughs> but relative interpretation, right? So that. Maybe we're not saying what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me, but, but what works in interpretation works for you, and it, what works in interpretation for me works for me. I, and I also, I do think this, I do think most people who object to the, the way the apostles read the Old Testament um, object to it in a way, object to it because they don't fully understand what the apostles are doing, um, or the scripture writers are doing, because we're going to look we're going to look a lot at Hebrews, right? And um, likely Hebrews wasn't written by an apostle. So, what is Paul doing? Let's look. Let's look at the. Uh, let's look at the allegory. Let's talk about the Hagar Sarah allegory. So here's what Paul does in Galatians four. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one of a slave woman and one of a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds with the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear, and break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will become more than the children of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as the time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so now, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. The son of the slave woman shall not inherit, shall not have an inheritance with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not sons of the slave, but sons of the free. What is Paul doing here? Well, here, I don't think he's unwarrantingly spiritualizing the text. I, I don't think that he's forgetting the literal sense of the text. I think, rather, Paul cares deeply about the literal sense of the text, and I think that the grounds for this allegory are born in the, uh, the literal sense of the text itself and in the intention of Moses. I think that Moses intends the Hagar uh, and Sarah story to be read like this. Um, so Paul reads the story of Sarah and Hagar allegorically, so that Sarah represents the new covenant and Hagar represents the old covenant. Uh, and he pushes it further to say that Galatians are like Isaac and the Judaizers are like Ishmael, right? So uh, the Judaizers are like Ishmael because they're born under the Sinai covenant, and the Galatians are like Isaac because they're born under the new covenant. So I do think that the Genesis text itself does much to compare Ishmael and Isaac. 
It has much to compare Ishmael and Isaac, and I think even to compare them in respect to two different covenants. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to read Genesis 22 and Genesis 21 and see, do you see any similarities between these two stories in Genesis 21 and Genesis 22? So Genesis 21 is an Ishmael story. Genesis 22 is an Isaac story. Do you see any similarities between the two stories? Okay, is there anything in this text that would make you want to compare and contrast Isaac and Ishmael? So I think that the text itself intends to show us that Isaac and Ishmael should be contrasted, specifically these two events in their lives. You, you see it? What, what do you see? Good. So the narrative, so what you're saying is the narrative itself is pushing us towards contrasting them. That's good. Do you think any, anything in the stories that sound the same? Yeah. Very good. Both of them were about to die and God intervened. That's very good. Anything else that's similar besides God intervening when they're about to die? Good. Yeah, both of them were taken by a parent. Yeah, both of them were taken by a parent into the wilderness. When? When did both of them leave? Early morning. Both of them left in the early morning and was taken by their parent into the wilderness where God intervened and rescued them. What else? How does... Is there something similar between what Hagar does and what Abraham does right before God intervenes? What does Hagar do before she sees the well? She lifts up her eyes. Okay, now go to the Abraham story. Does Abraham do the same thing? Look at verse 13. Abraham lifted up his eyes. And behold, there was a ram caught in the thicket. Do you see that? Abraham does the same thing Hagar does. Okay, here, and then here. Let me, um, this is, these are just my notes. It'll be easier to show you the spreadsheet here. Um, so first, Ishmael's departure parallels Isaac's sacrifice. So it starts with... Um, Sarah tells Abraham to cast out the slave woman with her son, which I think is paralleled with Yahweh saying to Abraham, take your son. Cast out the slave woman with her son, take your son. Now look here. In the Ishmael story, Abraham rose early, and he provided supplies for Ishmael in verse 14, similar to Abraham rose early and collected supplies for him and Isaac's trip. Okay, same thing. Then Hagar and Isaac depart on a journey, and I'm sorry, this should be Ishmael. Hagar and Ishmael. And then here, Abraham and Isaac depart on a journey. Abraham places bread and water on Hagar's shoulders in verse 14. And here, Abraham places wood for the offering on Isaac's shoulders. Then, and then Ishmael is close to death and Isaac is close to death. And an angel intervenes in both stories. Lift up your eyes, uh, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, the angel says, and then that's compared with do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to harm him, the angel says to Isaac. God opens Hagar's eyes and she sees a well of water. Abraham lifts up his eyes and he sees a ram. That should, he doesn't see a ramp, he sees a ram. Um, then uh, God promises a blessing to Ishmael and God promises a blessing to Isaac. Then you have the aftermath, Isaac lives in Paran and Abraham lives in Beersheba. The narratives are paralleled uh, almost exactly. There, I'll zoom out there if you want to see it. So I think, I, I do think the story itself is intending you to contrast Ishmael and Isaac, okay? And that's in the narrative structure of both stories. Now, but you have to then ask, why compare, why put Isaac in the New Covenant and and Ishmael in the Old Covenant. Why do that comparison, right? If, if the narrative is already comparing, why does Paul go on from that to say uh, Isaac is the Galatians and Ishmael is the Judaizers? Well, I think there's another that's a bigger narrative arc parallel. Okay, now this is the most complicated one we're going to look at, okay? We're going to look at some simpler ones of this, but I want to give you a, a category for it, okay? Um, I think that Abraham's Egypt story parallels 
Israel's Egypt story. Abraham's Egypt story parallels Israel's Egypt story. So let's go back to Genesis 12 and 13. And just read through it and think about the Israel-Egypt story and see if you see any parallels. Between Genesis 12, and you can just scan it, right? I mean, you kind of know the stories, but um, 12, look at 12... 10 to the end of the chapter especially. 12, 10 through the end of the chapter and say, is there anything similar that you'll see later in, the, in Israel's story of going to Egypt and coming out? Do you see any parallels between this and what Israel will later experience? There's a famine, good. There's a famine and so they go down to Egypt. Excellent. What else? Plagues. How does God deliver his people out of Egypt? Through plagues. Good. What else? Anything else that sounds like what's going to be the Israel story? Yes. Yeah, he went out with a lot of stuff, right? He left with a lot of stuff, just like Israel left with a lot of stuff from Egypt. Very good. So I think, I think this is what Moses is doing in the story, is he's saying that Abraham went through the Exodus before Moses did. He's trying to contrast Abraham and Moses to one another. Um, because, I think, as I mentioned yesterday, the big, the big story, the big contrast in the Torah is um, Moses and Abraham. Or justification by faith and justification by works. That Moses is an attempt to be justified by works and uh, Abraham is an attempt to be justified by faith, right? That's why Abraham dies in the promised land and Moses dies outside of the promised land. Um, so... The point here, then, is to represent the Abrahamic covenant against the Mosaic covenant. To say that Abraham, Abraham is the way to be justified by faith, while Moses is the way to be justified by works, and Moses can't get you there. So trust in Abraham and follow Abraham, not follow Moses. But, and I think that's one of the main themes of the Torah. So let's look at this. So first, they go to Egypt because of a famine in the land, both of them. Uh, Then... They go to sojourn in Egypt. They go to just sojourn in Egypt, right? Both of them do that. Uh, Then Sarah was beautiful in appearance. The same language is used of Joseph. Joseph is beautiful or handsome in appearance. Uh, Abraham desires that his life be spared. And God sent Joseph to Egypt that many people's life might be spared in the same language. Sarah, Abraham's wife, is taken into Pharaoh's house. Joseph enters into the service of Pharaoh. I'm sorry, of Potiphar. Um, and the Hebrew, and I think that's also parallel with the Hebrew women who are afflicted in slavery. Abraham gives sheep, oxen, donkey, and servant. Abraham is given sheep, oxen, donkeys, servants, and camels. And Joseph gives his brothers sheep, oxen, and donkeys. God afflicts Pharaoh with great plagues, and God afflicts Egypt with great acts of judgment and plagues. Pharaoh tells Abraham to go. Pharaoh tells Moses to go. Pharaoh sends Abraham and Sarah away. The Egyptians sent the people of of the land out with haste. Abraham leaves with great wealth. Israel leaves with great wealth from Egypt. Okay, so I think you're you're meant to read these two stories in light of each other in Moses' intention itself, right? And the point is that Abraham's exodus is better than Moses' exodus. Abraham's exodus is better than Moses' exodus. Um, And Abraham is justified by faith, whereas Moses is an attempt to be justified by works. Um, So let's let's keep going, though. Let's keep thinking about this. Um, So third, Ishmael and Isaac are born on opposite sides of Abraham's circumcision. Ishmael and Isaac are born on opposite sides of Abraham's circumcision circumcision. Uh, Ishmael was born in chapter 16 while Abraham was, to use the language of Paul, this is what Paul says in Galatians, still in the flesh. Because it's before circumcision. Isaac, though, is born in chapter 17 when Abraham is not in the flesh. He's a child born not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Fourth, Ishmael represents seeking God's blessing through works, while Isaac represents seeking God's blessing through faith. So the narrative itself, the narrative itself 
God tells Abraham that he will have a child, and Abraham looks at the stars in chapter 15 and believes, but then in chapter 16, he has a lack of faith, and he works for the child. He says, he, him and Sarah conspire together, and they say, we'll take Hagar, and we will make the promise happen. And if you look, look at how it's described. Look at 16, verse 3. Genesis 16, verse 3. Tell me if you have heard this language before. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar and gave to her husband, and he went into her. Where have you heard that language before? The garden, where she took of the fruit and gave to her husband, and he did eat. It, this, is, this is just, it's a repetition of the fall story. Abraham is a new Adam who falls just like the first Adam did. And all of this I'm getting from the Genesis text. I think Paul knew this story better than we know this story, and that's why it made sense to him. There, so my, my point is this, they're meant to contrast one another. First, in their deliverance stories. Second, they're meant to contrast one another. They're, they're already meant to contrast one another in their own covenants. In the Genesis story itself, so that Abraham goes on an exodus and Israel goes on an exodus. Third, they're born on opposite sides of Abraham's circumcision, which is what Paul says in Galatians 4. Let's go there. Look at verse 23. Ishmael was born according to the flesh, while the free one was born through the promise. Finally, and this is what applies to Paul's situation, um, is that uh, in Paul's situation, um, people were trying to get justification by works in Galatians, and Paul saying, no, you receive it by the Spirit. You, you wait and receive the promise that God will give to you. You don't go out and work for it. You receive it by faith, which... Con it, I, Ishmael is trying to work for the promises of God, and Isaac is waiting for God to provide that promise, okay? And so, that's why the conclusion makes sense. Cast out the son of the slave woman. Cast out the Judaizers. Cast out those who are trying to get justification by works instead of justification by faith. Okay, even if you don't track with everything I said, and even if you don't agree with all of it, here's my point. Paul is using literal interpretation here. He is not just allegorizing out of thin air. He is reading the Genesis text in its historical context. He cares deeply about the literal meaning. He cares deeply about what Moses said, and that is why he interprets like this. His, his allegorical reading, which is what he calls it an allegory, is born out of the literal meaning of the text. He's not just allegorizing for the fun of it, okay? That's all I'm trying to prove right now is that it's born out of the literal sense of the text. That's all I'm trying to prove right now, okay? But I want to look at, that's a very complicated one. Let's look at some more simple ones. Let's, let's look at some more simple ones. Um, let's look at Hebrews 4, 4 through 8. I'm trying to hit you up front with a difficult one so we can back up a little bit. Yeah, what's the question? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think that Paul sees it in a fuller sense than Moses did. Because Moses, because Paul sees the, the fullness of the new covenant in Christ, right? He, he has the greater revelation, and so he's able to read that back on Moses. Did Moses mean to write that so that Paul in Galatians would use it? No, I don't think so. But Paul, Paul, I think, is reading it within what Moses intended. Moses intended something. Really, God intended something with it, right? And Moses, Moses intended it with God. But Paul, Paul was building off of what Moses had already said, based on what had happened in Christ, I think. Why don't we look at a few more, and let's move on from there. Um, Hebrews 4, 8 through 11, says this. If Joshua had given the people rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever enters into God's rest 
has also rested from his work as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Okay, so here's what they're doing. They're saying that there's the Joshua story, and Joshua had given the people rest, but that we should strive to enter into another rest, a rest in heaven. And he, he bases it off of two texts. The first is saying that God entered rest. And the second is that Joshua gave the people rest. And he's combining these two texts to say, verse 11, let us strive to enter that rest. So what are the two texts that he has in mind? When did God enter rest? Genesis 2.2. 2. Okay, let's turn there. Genesis 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God entered into rest here. Now, it's just an observation in the Genesis story. <clears throat> Every day, look at day one. Look at how day one ends in verse 5 of chapter 1. And there was evening and there was morning the first day, and the first day ends. Now look at verse 8. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Okay. Um, look at verse 13. There was evening and there was morning the third day. Verse 19. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Verse 23. There was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Okay. And then verse 31. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Do you notice... The seventh day doesn't say that. There is no evening and morning to end the seventh day. And I think that the writer of the Hebrews notices that. I think he notices that, and this is why he says there still remains a rest for the people of God, because the seventh day never ended, in a sense. God enters his rest, and there is no evening and morning the seventh day. Okay. Now, let's look at Joshua Twenty-one forty-four. The story, one of the story of Joshua, is the people trying to get rest in the promised land. Genesis twenty-one forty-four. I'm sorry, Joshua twenty-one forty-four. Says this. The Lord gave them rest on every side. So Joshua gave the people rest, just as God entered rest on the seventh day, the seventh day which never ended. And he's reading that theme of rest that starts with God. God enters rest. Joshua gives the people rest. And now he's saying it's typological of a final rest. It points forward to a final rest. And so verse 11, let us strive to enter that rest. Let us strive to enter that rest. And look at verse 10. Look at what he says. Look at what he calls that rest. He calls it God's rest, entering into God's rest. Why can you enter into God's rest? Because there was no evening and morning at the end of the seventh day, I think. They're, my point is they're, they're taking the literal meaning of the text, and they're getting typological meanings from it. Let's look at, let's look at another one, Hebrews 7. Look at Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, um, so just verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to Abraham, and to Abraham appointed a tenth portion of everything. He is first, by translation, the king of righteousness, that is, the king of Salem. That, uh, he is first, um, by translation, the king of righteousness. And then... He is the king of Salem, that is, the king of peace. So the first thing he does is he says this. Um, the name Melchizedek itself is two Hebrew words, one meaning righteousness and one meaning peace. So he's the king of righteousness and he's the king of peace, which is why he's typological for Jesus. If your mind is spinning, uh, welcome to the club. Um, this is how they read the Old Testament. Look at verse 3 now. He was without father or without mother or genealogy. What, what does that mean? 
It is about father or mother or genealogy. Well, let's look back at the Genesis story. Look at Genesis 5. Genesis 5 is the first of two genealogies at the beginning of the Genesis story. The point is, you know, you know who everyone's mom and dad was. You know who everyone's mom and dad is in the Genesis story. Because you have this story of the genealogy in chapter 5, and then in chapter 10 you have the other genealogy. Um, so you know who everyone's mom and dad is. And you even know, at the, at the end of chapter 11, the genealogy of Abraham. You know who Abraham's dad is, you know who Lot's dad is, you know who everyone in the story's parents are. So then when you get to Genesis 14, and you have this guy named Melchizedek, who does not have a genealogy, you don't know who his mom was and who his dad was, this is what Hebrews says. This is how he reads it, out of the literal sense of the text. He is without father or mother or genealogy. Now, now, he's going beyond the text. Are you ready? Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God and that he continues a priest forever, right? You never see when he dies. You don't know where his parents come from. Therefore, we can read him typologically or allegorically as Jesus, who never was born and never died. Okay, let's keep going. If your mind is spinning, welcome to the club. I'm just reading this text. That's all I'm doing. I'm just telling you what he's doing. Don't, if you're confused, you're confused with this guy. You're not confused with me, I, I hope. Uh, because maybe I'm, I don't think, I think I'm explaining it well. But just, this is how they read the Bible, okay? <laughs> Look at verse 4. This is talking about Melchizedek. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes to the people, that is, of their brothers. Through these also are the descendants, though these are also the descendants of Abraham. So what's he saying? So Levi received tithes, just like Melchizedek received tithes. He's comparing Melchizedek and Levi. That's going to be very important, okay? Because they both received tithes. But this man, who does not have his descendant from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed who he who had the promise. Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham and blesses Abraham. Now here's, here's how he concludes, okay? It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. That's, that's pretty easy to understand. In, in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. That's Melchizedek. Verse 9, one, one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, who was in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Okay, I'm, this is what he's saying, okay? This is his whole point. You don't want to go back to the Mosaic Covenant because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Don't go back to the Mosaic Covenant because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. What? That's Christ. Can you imagine if I got up here on Sunday morning and I said, okay, guys, I know some of you, some of you are tempted to go and sacrifice a lamb on the Day of Atonement. Let me encourage you not to. And you know, you know how I'm going to do it? I'm going to encourage you not to because don't you remember that Abraham paid, paid tithes to Melchizedek? You would say, this man's crazy. This guy man is allegorizing. This is what this author does. The point is this. Abraham was a great, great grandparent of Levi. That's what he says. He was in the loins. Levi was in the loins of Abraham. And Abraham gave money to Melchizedek, which means that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And if Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, then Melchizedek is greater than Levi. And Melchizedek is a type of Christ. So therefore, Jesus is better than Levi, so don't go back to the Mosaic Covenant. If your mind is spinning, welcome to the club. This is how they read their Bibles. Let's look at a couple other examples. Look at Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. <clears throat> now, the only reason this one's simpler is because you've heard it before. Uh, Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. 
if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies from the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences from dead works to serve the living God? This one's easier, not because it's less complicated, but because you've heard it before. The Old Testament sacrifices purified people's consciences and brought them into the presence of God. So Jesus' sacrifice purifies your conscience and brings you into the presence of God. That's what he's saying. Now, let's do this. I want you to to go to Genesis chapter 4. I want you to try to read this story like the author of the Hebrews. Read Genesis 4, uh, 1 through 11. Read Genesis 4, 1 through 11. Now, here's the thing. The author of the Hebrews does mention the story. He just might not remember it because he mentions it so slowly. Genesis 4, 1 through 11. Can you think of how the author of the Hebrews might read this text? Okay, I want to read you from Hebrews 12. So, he's continuing to contrast the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. Let's look at 12, 18 in Hebrews. You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and to the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not even endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, he shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion. So he's contrasting two mountains, right? There's Mount Sinai and there's Mount Zion. You've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Did you know you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem? Did you know that? That's what he says. Welcome, welcome to the club. Um, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What's he saying? What did Abel's blood speak? Remember in Genesis 4, look at verse 10, the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Yeah. You're exact. The, the, so Cain kills his brother Abel. And, cry, and, and, Abel, and God says, I can hear the voice of your brother's blood. And it cries for justice, for revenge, for, for punishment to my murderer. So Jesus' blood also cries to God from the ground, and it says a far better thing than the blood of Abel. It cries not for justice, it it cries for forgiveness. It cries for our justification. He is reading this text and he says, Christ's blood says a better thing than the blood of Abel. And that's why he says, don't go back to the old covenant. Because if you go back to the old covenant, you're going back to Abel's blood. You're going back to the blood that says, condemn my murderer. Come instead to the blood that says, forgive my murderers. That's what he's saying. Let's look at a few more. Let's look at Paul. Um, go to Ephesians 4, verse 8. You know, we've read this text several times, but we haven't looked at the psalm that he quotes. Look at this. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Do you know where that's from? Psalm 68, 18. Can someone read Psalm 68, 18 for us? What does Psalm 68, 18 say? You receive gifts among men? Wait, what does Paul say? When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. What is Paul doing? What's Paul doing here? 
Now, does, yeah, does, does, maybe, so here's what some people say. Maybe Paul has a different manuscript of the Old Testament that says he gave gifts. And he's quoting from that. You know what the only problem with that is? We don't have any manuscripts that say that. None. The only, the only ones that we have, we have some in Syriac that were written three centuries after Paul. And probably, you know, most likely they were quoting Ephesians and changing the psalm in light of it. What's going on? Is Paul doing literal interpretation? I think he is. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to read Psalm 68, 1 through 18, and ask, what is the context? What's the context of Psalm 68? And does it help us understand? But I'll say this. So two things that are problematic, and you know them, but I'll just, say, I'll just state them. Number one, it's problematic, not just because he changes a word, but he, he, he says the opposite of the word in the text, right? It's not just one word is off. It's the opposite word, right? It, it from receive to give. That's a problem. Number two uh, is that, and it maybe it wouldn't be as big a problem if the Ephesians text, that, I mean, Paul's entire argument in Ephesians rests on the verb. He gave gifts, right? The, the enti- Paul's entire point is he gave gifts. So, What's he doing, right? Now it's, you, gotta, you need to know the answer. So go to Psalm 68, read Psalm 68, 1 through 18. What's the literal context of Psalm 68? What's the literal context? What's this psalm about? So what's Psalm 68 about? Let's talk through it. Very good, yeah. God defeats his enemies. And, and what's it describing... What event is it describing when God defeated his enemies? What's that? The Exodus. That's exactly right. Look at, look at verse 7. Oh God, you went out before your people when you marched through the wilderness, right? And then in verse 8, the God of Sinai, the God of Israel is what he's called. Um, talks about the flock. They found a dwelling in the flock, Right? And then, so then, um, so then in verse 18, what's that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Very good. Uh, The Lord is among them. Sinai is now his sanctuary. So verse 18, he ascended on high is God on top of Sinai, right? It's God on top of Sinai. The, The on high is not heaven. The on high is the top of Sinai, leading a host of captives in your train. That's the people he rescued in the Exodus story. And receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious. And here's the purpose. The purpose, the purpose of receiving gifts among men is so that the Lord may dwell there. So he received gifts for the purpose of building a temple or tabernacle, right? So that he may dwell there. He received gifts from men so that he could dwell among them. And isn't that what we see in the story, right? In the story, people are bringing a bunch of gifts, fabrics and gold and trees and things like that, so that God may live among them. He received gifts among men to build his old covenant tabernacle, right? God received gifts in the old covenant. God received gifts among men for the purpose of building his old covenant tabernacle. Why does God give gifts in Ephesians 4? Equipping the saints for the building up of the body of Christ. I mean, the whole, one of the whole major themes in Ephesians is that the church is the new temple. I think Paul, this is what Paul is doing, I think Paul is intentionally changing the verb to highlight the graciousness of the new covenant. A new covenant in which God does not receive gifts from men to build his temple, but God gives gifts to build his temple. God is building a temple in both texts, but in the old covenant, he's building it through the gifts that we give him. In the new covenant, he is building it through the gifts that he gives us. It's born out of the literal meaning of the text, once again. 
That's my whole point. Even if you don't get everything I'm saying and how we get there, get that it's born out of the literal meaning of the text. Let's look at another one in Ephesians, Ephesians 5.18. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Uh, look at Exodus 31.3. <clears throat> This idea of being filled with the Spirit, it comes right out of the Old Testament. Did you know that? Exodus 31.3. So starting verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God. And why does he fill him with the Spirit of God? Verse 4, to devise architectural design works, to build the tabernacle. Look at Exodus 35, 31. 35, 31. Here, he says again that he filled Basilel with the Holy Spirit, with intelligence, with knowledge, and workmanship. And again, it's for building of the tabernacle. And I I do think the main theme of Ephesians is the new covenant temple. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit in in Ephesians 5.18? It means to build the new covenant temple. To be able to work to build the new covenant temple. It's, born, it's language born out of the Old Testament, so we should read it with the Old Testament in mind. He's drawing that and saying in the new covenant temple, God is filling all of his people with the Spirit so that they address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, giving thanks to the Lord and submitting to one another. And look, look at what he says in verse 17 that they should not be foolish, but they should understand what the will of the Lord is. That is exactly the language from Exodus 34. He fills them with the Spirit of God with intelligence and knowledge and craftsmanship. He wasn't foolish, but he was filled with the Spirit. Why don't we look at John uh, 129? This is an easier one, right? The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, that's one you might skip over because it's so obvious and we talk about it all the time. But this is a massive statement in reading the Old Testament. To call Jesus the Lamb of God means what? What does it mean? What was the Lamb that took away sin in the Old Testament? Explain it to me. Yeah, the sacrificial system. Good. How did, Explain it to me further, though. So, what is the lamb that took away sin? So, it's pure good. What else? Is it a confusing question? Just tell me about the lamb in the Old Covenant that took away sin. When was it given? When was the lamb given that took away sin? When they were in the wilderness, right? For the purpose of entering the promised land, right? It sustains them in the wilderness, and through its sacrifice, God is accepting forgiveness of sins, right? So how, where, do we find, where do we find these people? Where do we find these people um, coming to John the Baptist's baptism? They are going through the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. The Jordan River is how you get into the promised land, right? So they're outside of the Jordan River. They're outside the promised land in a sense, right? And here he declares to them outside the promised land, this is God's lamb. What's he saying? Why are they baptizing the Jordan in the first place? Why would they do that? Why did John baptize people? John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You're right. Very good. So, but what does that have to do? So, the baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Very good. What does that have to do with Jesus being the lamb 
that takes away the sin of the world. Any thoughts there? Is there a connection? Yeah, he came to die for sinners. Yeah, I think you're getting something there. So let's look at Matthew's gospel. Look at verse 17 in Matthew chapter 2. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah. Here's the fulfillment. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they are no more. Do you know where that comes from? Do you have a footnote in your Bible telling you? Jeremiah 31, 15. Let's go there. Jeremiah 31, 15. Jeremiah 31. You guys should know that, right? Jeremiah 31 is the prophecy of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 15, right? Thus says the Lord, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children, and she refuses to be comforted because they are no more. The, the context, starting in verse 10, is that God's people are in exile. God's people are in exile. In fact, if you look back at the beginning of 31, God's people are in exile. Verse 4, but he promises, you shall plant vineyards in the mountain of Samaria. You will return to the promised land, is what he's promising. The God's people in exile will return to the promised land. But as for now, they are weeping because they're not in the promised land. They're exiled. They're outside the promised land. But God prophesies the day when they will return to the promised land. And verse 31 of that chapter talks about it. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers, but I will put, make this new covenant with them. And I will remember their sins no more, verse 34. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. The, this new covenant came with it, the promise of forgiveness of sins. Why is that important? Forgiveness of sins. Why was Israel in exile in the first place? Because they sinned, right? They got kicked out of the promised land because they sinned. So if you get forgiveness of sins, then what happens? You return to the promised land, right? You remember in the story of Haggai or even Nehemiah, when God's people returned to the promised land, did they get everything they were hoping they would get? No, they didn't. In fact, they were wailing and weeping. I think they're very aware that though they're back in the promised land, not all these promises have come to completion yet. They're back in the promised land, but not everything that God promises have. The new covenant hasn't come yet, right? They, they need something more. And so I think that's why the Gospels begin with John baptizing people in the Jordan River, going back into the promised land. And they're, they're wanting to return, not from a physical exile, but from a spiritual exile. They're wanting to return, not from a physical exile, but from a spiritual exile. So then when John says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, the one that the new covenant will come through, the one who gives you forgiveness of sins, the one who can bring you back from spiritual exile, that you're going through this Jordan River, as was just said, to try to get back, right? You're saying, I want to come back, and you're repenting of your sins as you're going through it, as Israel pointed out. You're going back, and you're going through the motions, but you haven't gotten back from spiritual exile yet. Jesus is the one who can do it. And that's why Jesus goes to the Jordan River, right? Not because he needs sins forgiven, but he goes to the Jordan River to say, it's time to come back from exile. That's why this exile language is so important in the New Testament, because in the New Testament, this return from exile is very spiritually important. And the return from exile, if you look at Ephesians 1 even, is tied to the idea of the forgiveness of sins. They're always tied together. And so you have to be spiritually forgiven of sins if you are to return from exile spiritually. I think there was a question. Is that right? What's up? 
The Son of God with whom God is well pleased means Jesus is the new Israel. And that's what, look, so he calls him his beloved son with whom he's well pleased. Now look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at what Jesus is called. In Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved one. He's referring to the baptism of Jesus, I think. He calls him the beloved one, the one in whom the father, the son in whom the father is well pleased. We find adoption in the one, in the true son of God with whom God is well pleased. I think that's what he's saying. Very good. Hmm. I, I think so, but maybe not in the baptism moment, because it doesn't really connect it to the moment of his baptism. I think probably the stronger connection, so Leviticus 16, I think you're catching on to something but not quite. So Leviticus 16 is what you're referring to. So that's the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> it's the Day of Atonement in which the high priest, there was, there was a, two goats that day, okay? The one that he laid his hands on and he sent it out into the wilderness never to be seen again. The other that he laid his hands on and they killed it. And I think both show us Christ. That the one that went out into the wilderness for the sins never to be seen again, the sins were put on him, and their sin is removed as far as the east is from the west, never to be seen again. That's what Christ does. He takes, Christ takes our sins and throws them into the wilderness. But Christ is also the lamb who dies for our sins so that he takes the penalty we deserve for our sins. So I, I'd, I'd put it more in the moment of the crucifixion. And <clears throat> it's interesting because I think John does too. Because John in his gospel, let's go to John's gospel. So John 19, verse 14. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And then Jesus is crucified. So <clears throat> John mentions that it's the Passover just before Jesus dies. The, the, the gospel begins with saying, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and it ends with saying, it's on the day of Passover that Jesus dies. I think the point is to say that he, he dies as that, that Lamb, right, um, in his crucifixion, yeah. I think that they're saying uh, the return from exile, the return from exile was accompanied with the forgiveness of sins. So if you're kicked out of the promised land because you sinned, the only way to get back into the promised land is if your sins are forgiven, right? And so that's what Jeremiah 31 prophesies, is there's going to be a day when God forgives your sins and you come back into the promised land. And so Israel is standing right on the border of the promised land, trying to go through the waters. They're saying, I want to go back into the promised land. But they're already in the promised land, right? They're in the promised land physically, but they're saying, we haven't returned from exile spiritually. That's what they're saying. We, we want something more. We want something more than what we've already been given. That's what they're saying, I think. And I think, so this is, this is a bit of a different question, but I'm happy to talk about it. So I think <clears throat> they, um, yes, I think they were old covenant believers who didn't know the fullness of Christ. And in fact, there's people in Acts. Does anyone remember which story this is where they find people who only knew of John's baptism? What's that? Acts 19, let's go there. <clears throat> yeah, this is right. Um, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus, and there he found some disciples. I think he means disciples of John, and we'll see that. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. Right? And Paul said, John baptized with baptism for repentance, telling, you, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. So I think these are old covenant believers in Acts 19. They're old covenant believers who haven't heard there is a Jesus so then when they believe that there's a Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit. Um, so I think that that's what's happening. So yes, they're forgiven. In the same way that people sacrificed lambs in the Old Covenant were forgiven, right? In that as much as they trusted in Christ through the lamb. So here, 
um, it, it's made explicit, right? John's baptism was telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, in the same way the lamb was trying to tell you to go to look to Christ, the one coming after. So yeah, they were forgiven. But if you today say, I want to be baptized in John's baptism, even though I know fully about Jesus Christ, your sins are not forgiven and you are dead in your sins. Let's look at Colossians real quick and then we'll take our break. What is happening here I think that Paul's analogy in Colossians is really helpful for understanding it. Verse 16, Colossians 2, 16. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to festivals or new moon or a Sabbath. These are the shadow of things that are to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. They're a shadow, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay, I want you to imagine... I think we have a shadow right here, right? I can put a shadow on the wall behind me from the light, okay? This is, the, the picture is that there's a massive light shining on Jesus, and behind him is a shadow. And the shadow is the sacrificial system, it's Melchizedek, it's Ishmael, it's all of these Old Testament realities are the shadow. But as time would go on, you would eventually find the person. You'd find the person that the shadow points to. So I want you to imagine with me that you walk, you walk up to me after this lecture because you have deep concerns for my salvation, right? And, and I'm standing right here, and instead of talking to me, you, you go to my shadow and you start talking to my shadow, right? You would say that you're a crazy person, um, that normal people don't do that. That's Paul's, that's Paul's point, Paul's point is don't go to the Old Covenant because the Old Covenant is the shadow of Christ, but it's not Christ himself. But shadow, if you see my shadow, then you know I'm there. And, and the shadow should direct you straightway to me so you can talk to me, right? So also, these Old Covenant realities were meant to send us straightway to Christ. They are the shadow, and Christ is the substance. That's the analogy. I think it's very helpful. Here's the, here's the idea I want to end on, okay? Typology is prophecy. Typology is prophecy. And we'll come back to explore that in more detail. Typology is prophecy. The Exodus story was a prophecy of Jesus. The Passover land was a, lamb was a prophecy of Jesus. The rock that was struck was a prophecy of Jesus. The manna that came down was a prophecy of Jesus. The serpent lifted up in the wilderness was a prophecy of Jesus. All of these were prophecies. because pro we, we have too narrow a view of prophecy. We think that prophecy is, thus says the Lord, one day a man will be born of a virgin. No. That's why Matthew says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. We don't understand what they're doing because we don't even know what biblical prophecy is. That's our biggest issue. Typology is prophecy. So, so what I mean by that is prophecy is both, in the Old Testament, prophecy is both statements of direct fulfillment, okay, as well as typological patterns, okay? Um, statements of direct fulfillment and um, patterns. Um, so, um, let's look at uh, a couple examples. Let's go to Matthew 2, 5 through 6. So, this is when Herod asked the Magi, where is Jesus going to be born? And they say, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophets, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now let's go to Micah 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathrite, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth one who is a ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is of, uh, is of old, from ancient of days. This is very simple. Micah said, a ruler for all of Israel will come out of Bethlehem, and it's fulfilled in Jesus 
coming out of Bethlehem. That's about as simple as it comes, right? He will come out of Bethlehem, and he does come out of Bethlehem. You're waiting. You're waiting for, like, the hook. Like, Abba was like, he was just so nervous. Like, is it going to be that complicated? No, it's that, it's that simple. Okay, let's look at Matthew 18. I'm sorry, Matthew 8, verse 17. So Jesus heals the people. <clears throat> and then it says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Isaiah 53, verse 4, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. It's just a, a prophecy with a direct fulfillment in Jesus. It's about as simple as it gets. But there are, <clears throat> there are, we could call if we could call those direct fulfillments. There are also indirect fulfillments. Okay, indirect fulfillments that uh, that they don't say what does this prophecy say would happen, but instead what pattern does this historical event anticipate? What pattern does this historical event anticipate? How does the narrative of the Old Testament anticipate Jesus? Let's go to Romans five. This is an example there. Romans 5. It's a very, <clears throat> very well-known one. So read Romans 5, uh, 12 through the end of the chapter, and say, what, what is Paul doing here with the Adam story? Read Romans 5, 12 through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> what is Paul doing with the Adam story? Good. He's comparing and contrasting Christ and Adam. <clears throat> in what ways? Yeah, their relationship to mankind. Very good. How do they relate to mankind? Tell me more about that. Yeah. Yeah, one brings death and one brings life. <clears throat> and how do they bring death and how do they bring life? Adam brings death. How? Yeah, by one act of sin. <clears throat> Jesus brings death, or bring, Jesus brings life. How? Um, I think the Old Testament anticipates this. The Old Testament anticipates this. So um, <clears throat> let's, let's look at, and I alluded to this earlier, but let's look at it in more detail. Let's look at Genesis 8 and 9. I think that <clears throat> the Old Testament story itself starts a cycle. It starts a cycle of failed atoms. That ultimately uh, is fulfilled and finalized. The cycle stops when you get to Jesus, the final Adam. And, and in a sense, the Old Testament story is a story of saying, who will be the one like Adam who will make all things right again? Um, so what are, can you see any connections between Genesis 8 and 9 and the creation story and the Adam story? Why don't we start? In verse 1 of chapter 8, God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. It's the same thing that happened in the Genesis story. When God made, not a wind, but his spirit, it's the same Hebrew word, ruach, the ruach of God. And the Genesis story hovered over the waters, right? And then we find in the creation of the world that the waters part and dry land appears. <clears throat> so here, God sends a wind over the waters again. Now, look at chapter 7, verses 10 through 12. What was, the, what was happening before that? The waters came upon the earth, the great deep burst forth, it rained 40 days and 40 nights upon the earth. Compare that with Genesis 1, verse 9, which is this. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear, and it was so. Before that, in verse 2, there was waters over the creation, right? So this is a 
parallel here. There's a parallel to the creation story and the flood story is what I'm saying. Then in Genesis 1.28, God says to them, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. And God says the same thing to Noah <clears throat> in Genesis 9.1. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He's being set up. There's a new creation and there's a new, <clears throat> a new Adam. God created Adam, Genesis 2 verse 5, when there was no man to work the ground. Then in Genesis 9, verse 20, it says that Noah began to work the ground. <clears throat> God plants a garden in Genesis 2. Noah plants a vineyard in Genesis 9. Adam eats the forbidden, forbidden fruit. Noah becomes drunk with the fruit of the vineyard. Adam's nakedness is exposed. Noah lay uncovered, naked in his tent. <clears throat> then words of judgment are spoken. In Genesis 3, and Noah curses Ham in Genesis 9. Right, so once again, the story is repeating itself. <clears throat> I think you see the same thing in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> so God blesses Adam just as he blesses Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God commands Adam to be fruitful and multiply, and <clears throat> God tells Abraham that he will make him fruitful, and multiply him. Several times. Rebecca's friends say, um, may your thousands be multitude, and may your seed possess the gates of those who hate him. Um, as I swore to Abraham, I will multiply your seeds, right? Um, I will make you fruitful and multiply. God causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and there's only other, one other deep sleep in the entire Old Testament, and that's when God makes the covenant with Abraham. God causes a deep sleep to fall on him. Abraham, Adam fails to protect his wife, so Abraham fails to protect his wife twice, and Isaac has the same sin with Rebekah. The Messianic line does not come through Adam's firstborn, just as the Messianic line does not come through, um, through Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob's firstborn. It comes through someone later on in their descendants, right? I think they're all set up then as new Adams. They're set up as new Adams in the story. <clears throat> then I think Israel is set up as a new Adam also. God commands Adam to be fruitful and multiply, right? Um, compare that to Exodus 1. Israel was fruitful and swarmed and multiplied. Adam is called God's son. Israel is God called God's firstborn son. Adam is placed in a garden. Israel inherits the promised land. Adam is exiled from the garden when he sins, and Israel is exiled from the garden when he sins. A lot of this section of my notes come from Jim Hamilton's book on typology here. His, he was very helpful. Um, G.K. Beale was very helpful here. David and, David and Solomon are set up as new Adams as well. So God rests on the seventh day. Um, so David, after he defeats all of his enemies, rests before his sin with Bathsheba. Um, again, Adam is God's son. David will be God's son in 2 Samuel 7.14. God places Adam in a garden. <clears throat> and Solomon's temple is full of garden images. So there's lily and pomegranates in the temple. The, there's cherubim on the outside of the temple. What does that remind you of, of the, in the Adam story? The cherubim? Yeah, the cherubim guards the entrance to the, the uh, garden, right? <clears throat> so when, you, when you're going into the temple, if you see the cherubim uh, on the curtain as you're going in, what's What's being said is you're going back into the Garden of Eden, right? You're going back into the Garden of Eden is what's being said, because that's what's at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Um, <clears throat> Adam is charged with working the ground, so Solomon makes the promised land like a garden. And here are the references to that. Uh, he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees. He plants vineyards. He makes gardens and parks, ponds of water to irrigate the forest and growing trees. Um, during Solomon's rule... Israel lived in safely, safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree. Solomon made gold abound during his reign, um, bdellium and onyx, just like in Eden. <clears throat> Adam's commanded not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Solomon asks that God would give him an understanding heart to discern between good and evil. He's seen as a new Adam. <clears throat> Adam is commanded to have dominion over the garden. So Solomon has dominion over the promised land in 1 Kings 4.24 is what it says. Adam is told to rule over all the earth. 
and Solomon excels all the kings of the earth, and the whole earth seeks his wisdom. <clears throat> so what I'm, what I'm saying there is that this pattern of new atoms is in the Old Testament itself. So, so Paul is not just reading the Adam story and coming up with, this is a cool allegory. Why don't we just do this? Everything I've been saying so far is that the typological meaning is always based upon the literal meaning. And that's what the New Testament authors are doing. They're going from the literal meaning to the typological meaning. And, and you can see this as the story of the Old Testament unfolds itself. Jesus is a better Adam. He is the one that all of the other Adams pointed towards. <clears throat> He's the final Adam, as Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 15. The, I think, in that sense, the story of the Old Testament is very similar to John, right? John in Revelation 5, <clears throat> when he weeps loudly because he wonders who will be able to break the scroll and open its seals. That's the story of the Old Testament. Who will be able to come and bring all of God's salvific purposes to pass? Who will come and make this happen? And then finally, the lion from the tribe of Judah conquers, and he is able to take the scroll. Now, that's the story of David and the story of Abraham, and the story of Gideon, the story of Samson. All of these are failed Adams who, who aren't able to bring all of God's saving purposes to pass. But then finally, one does come like a lion, right, from the tribe of Judah, who's also a lamb who's been slain, and, and he's able to bring all of God's saving purposes to pass. So I, I, I think, so kind of my, my point there is that typology is prophecy. Typology is prophecy. Um, with that, though, so typology is not only seen in persons. Typology is not only persons. It's three things. Typology is persons, events, and institutions. Persons, events, and institutions. Okay? So, 1 Corinthians 5.7. Persons, events, and institutions. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So the Passover, as an event, points to Jesus, right? It means the Exodus, as an event, points to Jesus. Also, institutions. So we go to Hebrews 8. 1 through 7. Now, this is what we are saying. We have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the holy places, <clears throat> the true tent of the Lord, set up not by men. For every high priest is appointed, office, needs to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for the priest to also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. When Moses was about to erect a tent, he was given instructions by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than that of the old covenant, than he, as he mediates a better covenant, since it is enacted on better promises." For the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. So the temple, or the tabernacle, pointed to Christ as well. So persons, events, and institutions. And, and here's, here's the point, okay? Here, a typology, typology is a pattern in the Old Testament. It's in the, old, it's in the mind of the Old Testament authors themselves. And it points to Jesus because typology always intensifies. Typology always intensifies. When there are typological patterns, we must understand that the fulfillment of all of them is always better than what has come before. The fulfillment is always better than what has come before. And it always brings the pattern to conclusion. Okay? So, so... When we saw Jesus as the new Adam, when we saw Jesus as the new Adam, um, what we don't expect to see then are more new Adams, right? 
We're not, we're not looking for another new Adam after Jesus. Jesus is the end of the pattern of the new Adams, right? Um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15 goes into this as well. Let's, let's look there. So 1 Corinthians 15, 21 says this. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come resurrection from the dead. Right. So Adam brings death, Jesus brings resurrection. Verse 22, in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Then verse 45 says this, the first Adam became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, that's probably the harder one. What's he quoting when he says, the first man, Adam, became a living being? Genesis 2, verse 7. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 7 says this, The Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. The man became a living creature. So this one is a little bit more interesting because what is he saying? He's saying the moment in which Adam is taken out from the ground because God breathed into him so that he would become a living being, Jesus, as the last Adam, is better because he gives resurrection life to dead people. He's better than Adam, not just because he brings life um, as a new Adam, but here it's, it's equating Jesus' action of bringing life with God from Genesis 2. God breathes into Adam's nostrils, so here Jesus becomes a life-giving spirit. So again, though, the, the literal sense of the text is what drives this typological reading, right? He's not leaving the literal sense of the text, and he's not even, even leaving what Moses intended. He's just showing how Jesus is the final and ultimate expression of these things. Um, so so here's, here's part of the point. I'm saying that, that Jesus is the climax of the entire biblical narrative. He's the climax of all these typological patterns. So he's the final Adam, meaning we shouldn't expect more Adams. He's the final serpent in the wilderness, so we shouldn't expect more serpents in the wilderness, right? All of these things are pointing to him. Uh, he's the final Passover, so we shouldn't expect more Passovers. He's the final temple, so we shouldn't expect more temples. All of these things find their fulfillment and climax in Christ. That's what progressive revelation means. Okay, so a typology always intensifies and is fulfilled in Christ. Now, I do want to look at one other text when it comes to typology. Let's go to Ephesians 5:32. I'm sorry, Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands shall love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. Now we get the Old Testament quotation. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Christ and the the church. <clears throat> um, Augustine, Augustine had a principle of typology uh, called totos Christos, meaning the total Christ. Um, what he meant by that was that um, typology is about Christ and all of Christ, meaning it's about Christ as head and Christ as body. Christ as head and Christ as body, meaning this typology is about Christ, but it's also about his church. The church as the body of Christ is also anticipated 
in the Old Testament. And this is a text that shows us that, right? Adam and Eve being married in the garden is typological not just of Jesus as the new Adam, but Eve is typological of the church. You could say that while Christ is the new Adam, the church is the new Eve. Christ is the new Adam, and Christ's wife is the new Eve. And I think that you see that then throughout biblical texts, okay? You see that throughout biblical texts. Um, let's go to Genesis 24. <clears throat> so we already, we already said that Isaac is a, is a new Adam. Okay, so do you remember we talked about how Isaac is a new Adam, right? A Isaac is described like Adam. He's in this cycle of typological patterns, okay? And I do think that Rebecca then is typological of, his, of a new Eve, which is found in the church, okay? So let's look at Genesis 24. Um, this is a lengthy chapter. This is a lengthy chapter. Can you read, how about just read Genesis 24? Ah, no, I'll just summarize it. So here's what happens in Genesis 24. And I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to trace the ways the Old Testament authors read this text, okay? And read all of these texts. So um, Isaac, we've already established, is set up by Moses as a new Adam, um, which then his wife, I think, is set up as a new Eve, uh, which then finds fulfillment in Christ and the church. Uh, so Genesis 24, verses 3 through 4. So the father, right, the father, Abraham, says to the servant, uh, why don't we start in verse 1? Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all his things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who he put in charge of all things, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for Isaac. So the father asked the servant to go and find a bride for the son. The father asked the servant to go and find a bride for the son. Look at verse 53. <clears throat> the servant brought out jewelry and silver and gold and garment and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother's costly ornaments. This is the dowry price. So a great price is paid for the purchase of this bride. And then, look at verse 61. Rebekah and her young woman arose and rode on camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah, and he went his way. And now Isaac returned from that place and was dwelling in Negev. And Isaac went out to meditation in the field towards evening, he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there was coming, there were camels coming, and Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. And the servant, uh, and said to the servant, who is this man walking to meet us in the field? And the servant said, it is my master. So she took off the veil and covered herself, took off the veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her to the tent of Sarah, and the mother took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Um, put simply, this is the story of the father who <clears throat> sends the servant to get the bride and brings the bride to the son, uh, and they see one another face to face, and then... Uh, they're married. Uh, it's the story of the Bible. It's the story of the gospel. The father sends the son, the spirit to get the bride for the son. Uh, Warren Austin Gage says this of this text. The same gospel question first spoken to Rebecca is asked of each one of us. Will you go with this man? Like Rebecca, let us freely abandon all we have known and give our lives to love the one for whom God has chosen us. For nothing in this world can compare to the glorious future that awaits those who those invited to the wedding of Christ and his bride. Will you go with this man? Freely, faithfully, with a heart fixed on absolute devotion to the one who has given his life for you. Let us answer with Rebecca, 
I will go. And I, I think I'm reading this based upon what Paul has set up for me. Let's, let's look, um, let's compare, let's do this, compare Eve in Genesis 2 and 3 uh, to the church. Are there any other, are there any other texts, are there any other texts in scripture besides Ephesians 5 that points forward to this? So let's look, what's that? <clears throat> yes, very good. Let's look, um, yeah, Adam as the new, uh, Jesus is the new Adam, certainly. Um, was there a specific text you were thinking of? Oh, yeah, you're right. Don't let the devil deceive you as he deceived Eve. That's good. That's very good. Huh. I hadn't thought about that one before. Look at Genesis 2, 22 through 23. In the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into the woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. So, look at Revelation 21, which is the, a text that's supposed to parallel this. Revelation 21, verse 1. I think it parallels this well. <coughs> I saw a new heaven and a new earth, which is meant to make you think of Genesis 1, right? I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away and was no more. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay, so the bride is coming to the husband, right? So look at Genesis 2. The rib that the Lord had taken the man and made into a woman, oh, sorry, and the, the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So God will bring the church to his son. Okay? Adam's side is opened up in Genesis 2.22 and to give life to Eve. There's a wound in Adam's side to give life to Eve. So John 19.34. But one of the soldiers pierced Christ's side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. Christ's side also takes a wound, and through his wound, he gives life to the church. In the Adam story, he then he goes into a great sleep, and then is awakened in a garden. So Christ goes into the tomb, in verse 41, in a garden, and he's resurrected in a garden. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So Christ left his father in heaven and joined himself to the church and united her to him. Ephesians 5, 32. 